I can't recall many things quite as surreal as watching Israel, the country that has spent the last year mercilessly bombing not just the civilian population, but all of the civilian infrastructure of Gaza day after day after day without the slightest concern for civilian life, essentially making Gaza completely uninhabitable for a long time for the civilian population there, as was intended. There was a new study published today by Oxfam, the part of the United Nations that tracks such things, that documented the fact that more women and children were killed in the first year of this Israeli war in Gaza than any conflict in decades, certainly in this century. This is a country, Israel, that as well, just got done invading Lebanon, its neighbor, after all this sanctimony that we've heard from the United States for years about how borders are sacred, Rush, things like the Russian invasion of Ukraine, invasion of a, a sovereign state are things from the brutal, distant past of the 19th century, even though many of the people saying that were responsible for the invasion of Iraq. And now suddenly, not only is the United States unbothered by the invasion of the sovereign country, they're supporting it, cheering it, financing it, and arming it. And so here you have a country, Israel, that has not just been bombing Gaza, is not now just bombing Beirut, flattening apartment buildings, killing close to 1,000 people just in the last week alone in Lebanon, is bombing Syria whenever it wants, various parts of Damascus. And then somehow they just turn around today and depict themselves as this kind of besieged victim. As though they were just minding their own business, not harming a fly, and out of nowhere, because they're an apocalyptic cult or the religious extremists, Iran decided to launch a very limited and targeted attack on Israel that didn't harm a hair on the head of a single Israeli, let alone kill any Israelis. Even though if Iran really wanted to, they obviously have the capability to do so. And now all of the discourse in the United States, in Western Europe, and in Israel, the very small slice of the world typically referred to as the international community, are all rushing to compete with one another to who can bow with more passion and belligerence that they stand with Israel, that they're ready to fight for Israel, as though this all just took place out of nowhere, sort of like as though September 11th took place out of nowhere. Why did they attack us? We're just a peaceful country who never bothers anybody. Whereas if October 7th happened in a vacuum, oh, everyone, everything was so great between the Israelis and the Palestinians until October 7th. Things were so peaceful. Everybody was so happy. And they said, out of nowhere, Hamas attacked for no reason, no apparent reason whatsoever. And now the same discourse is being offered to explain the Iranian attack today on Israel. And I think it's very important to note that this discourse, this narrative, is only offered inside the United States and Western Europe and Israel. The rest of the world does not see things this way at all, at all. But American politicians have decided that even though they constantly claim that China is this great existential adversary of the United States, that we don't care about isolating ourselves from the world. We don't care about alienating the rest of the world in order to stand with Israel or to fuel the war in Ukraine, even if it means alienating countries in every region on every continent of the world and driving them to China, which is actually what's been happening. It's a complete contradiction of alleged interests, all in the name of defending this one foreign country and tying ourselves to them and to every word that they have. Now, just to give you a few of the basic media accounts that described exactly what happened today, here from The Guardian, you see the headline, Iran attacks Israel. And this is, this is actually a video from The Guardian showing the launch of a, a bunch of ballistic missiles. As I said, ballistic missiles are much faster, more powerful, more controlled than the very slower cruise missiles and drones that the Israelis purposely used in uh, April, all of, pretty much all of which were intercepted easily. A lot of these missiles shot by Iran today are no joke. They're very fast. They shot 200 of them, confusing the Iron Dome, making it impossible to intercept even a majority of them. And some of the video here from The Guardian demonstrates what it looked like over Tel Aviv.
the Iron Dome, but most of them freely falling to Earth uh, and then exploding once they, once they hit their target. I mean, there were dozens of these missiles that you could just watch. There you see some of them just falling right into the ground, hitting, blowing things up as they explode. Um, these were the first images. It looked extremely severe. Now, those were Tel Aviv. This is what was happening over Jerusalem. And you can see the extent of this, and obviously people reacting to this as though it was some kind of apocalypse. Wow, this is like a major attack on Israel. Now, you might recall that the one in April was viewed similarly when they saw all those missiles aimed at Israel. There was all this kind of discourse about how this changes history forever. This is going to, you know, explode the Middle East into this uh, conflagration of fire and brimstone. And yet once people realized how limited that attack was, how purposely primitive it was, designed to symbolically retaliate but not in fact retaliate, it took people just a couple of days to rein in that rhetoric. And I suspect, I at least hope, maybe don't expect, but at least hope that once people understand what actually happened here as opposed to the immediate visual that was depicted, the same thing will happen, namely that almost all of these missiles were precisely aimed at things like air bases of the IDF, the Mossad headquarters. Unlike what Israel has been doing in Beirut and Gaza, deliberately targeting residential buildings, blowing up entire neighborhoods of, of civilians, blowing up hospitals and schools and refugee camps run by the UN, ensuring the death of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of civilians. This is exactly the opposite of what Iran did, namely clearly pur purposely targeting military installations to the point where not even a single Israeli was killed because they had telegraphed in advance that this was coming. The Israelis were able to vacate those places, put people in bunkers. Here is, uh, this too is from, uh, I believe, The Guardian. Uh, we can check on what the source of... Th this is a uh, recorded video uh, from somebody who was in Tel Aviv uh, using their cell phone to track some of these missiles. So you can see a lot of these missiles are falling and exploding, meaning the vaunted Iron Dome was not a match for a lot of these missiles given how fast they were falling. These missiles can travel from Iran to Israel in 12 minutes. And when that many are shot, it is impossible for the Iron Dome to intercept them, especially given how fast they are. Here's a little more information from the New York Times report earlier today. Iran launches about 200 ballistic missiles at Israel. Quote, the attack, which ended, up which ended shortly after it began on Tuesday evening, was a sharp escalation in the long-simmering conflict between Israel and Iran and could uh, tip the region further into turmoil. The article reads, quote, Iran fired at least 200 ballistic missiles at Israel on Tuesday evening. Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps said in a statement that the missile attack had been in retaliation for the assassination of Hezbollah's leader, Hassan Nasrallah, Hamas's political leader, and an Iranian commander, the Iranian commander who died in the bombing in Beirut, the statement said Iran would launch more missiles if Iran were attacked. So in other words, Iran has made clear, like they did in April, this is the end of our retaliation. We retaliated, we stated the reasons why, and even though we didn't kill a single Israeli, this is the end of our retaliation unless you come and attack us and then we're gonna retaliate even further and presumably with a lot more aggression the next time. So essentially, it's up to the United States and to Israel to determine the extent to which this escalates. Obviously, there's a lot of different options that the Israelis can use. The Israelis will retaliate. They almost have to. The question is, will they treat it as some kind of all-out war and just start bombing oil refineries in, in Iran or nuclear facilities in Iran? Or will they just do a kind of tit-for-tat, which is not really within the Israeli political culture at the moment? Here from CNN, just to give you a sense for, I think the most significant part of this is actually watching missiles fly over Tel Aviv. Because in a lot of ways, the Israeli social contract with Israel, with the Israelis is, look, 
we're a right-wing government. We're going to be extremely aggressive in how we treat our neighbors. And now we're not even going to pretend to be interested in a two-state solution. In fact, we're going to annex the West Bank and force out every Arab from Gaza, which is obviously the real purpose of that war. There's nothing to do with hostages. And in exchange, we promise you that you'll get to just kind of continue your life, your great life. In Tel Aviv, you'll get to have your nice restaurants and your dance parties and your beaches, because those are secular Jews who don't have these grand visions of greater Israel. And that's the way that you get the population to support these wars. It's always the case that as long as the government wages war in a way that doesn't really affect the population, you rarely see the kind of protests that you see when the population is affected. Compare, for example, the anger and protest over the Vietnam War where young men in huge numbers were being drafted to go fight a war in a jungle for reasons that nobody understood and how angry that made them and how many protest uh, movements there were over it how much disruption there was versus the war on terror when there was barely any impact to the United States. The only people fighting were people who were voluntarily enlisted in the United States military. There was no draft. And there was a little political pushback, but no real opposition. If a country can go around bombing everybody else, as long as the population stays unaffected and safe, they're always going to be fine with it. Why would they care? That's the reason why the U.S. population has been basically indifferent to how many countries the United States has bombed over the last 30 years because almost never, other than 9-11 and a couple other very smaller, uh, small incidents, did it ever come back and affect U.S. soil. And even though no Israelis were harmed or killed, seeing how many missiles the Iranians were able to fly over and land in Tel Aviv I think was psychologically shocking and probably a little terrifying in a way that might be actually healthy for the Israelis to feel given how much they've been imposing that exact sort of terror and far, 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 far worse on their neighbors for at least the last year and obviously for a lot longer. So here is a video from CNN where Jim Scudo was on a roof in Tel Aviv, obviously thinking that he could safely stay there while reporting on air live on CNN while Dana Bash, the hardcore Israel supporter, was hosting the show. And you can see the reaction of Jim Scudo that probably replicated in many, many Israelis in Tel Aviv who always thought they were so protected and safe when they realized that actually they may not be so safe. Uh, and now what we're seeing, in addition to those intercepts, is we're seeing fragments falling to the ground. It's like a, yeah. a deadly a deadly fireworks display over Tel Aviv. Goodness, and you're there was talking an impact about just Tel Aviv. to the left of us here. And you're talking about Tel Aviv, Jim. We are looking at pictures right now. Oh, we are looking picture, at pictures of Tel Aviv, what you're describing. Oh, Jesus. Oh. Oh, God. Okay, guys, we got to get off the roof. These are coming down. Now, let me just say, before I show you the rest of this, do you hear that CNN reaction? Dana Bash was like, oh, my God, oh, just like seeing a, a, a missile explode in Israel. She's like, I mean, Dana Bash, you might remember, after October 7th, went on air and, like, recited a four-minute Jewish prayer. And needless to say, she never did anything like that over the many times that Israel has bombed its neighbors, killed children in, in Gaza. She has an emotional investment in Israel, like a lot of CNN personalities do. And you can see it manifest there. She's gasping on air while she watches something happening in Israel that is a tiny, minute fraction of what has been happening in Gaza over the last year and Beirut over the last 10 days and other places in the Middle East, including Syria, that Israeli, Israeli, the Israelis attack with complete uh, compunction. And uh, just to give you a sense for how alarmed they were, watch the rest of this. Driving. Oh, Jesus. Oh. oh, God. Okay, guys, we got to get off the roof. These are coming down right next to us here. Please do, Jim. Please do. They're coming down. One just about. We got to go inside. Jim, please take cover.
see missiles falling everywhere, flying through the sky. We are listening and we are watching. All right, so that's how CNN reacts when they see a few missiles falling near, near Tel Aviv. And the difference in their reaction could not be any starker or more glaringly different than when they hear about or talk about or see huge numbers of dead babies and children and women and innocent men as we've seen day after day after day since October 7th in places like Gaza. Now, one of the things I've seen a lot of people saying today is that the reason there were no civilian casualties in Israel, even though a lot of military targets were attacked by Iran, is because the, the Israelis are more civilized and therefore they don't put their military installations in civilian areas, or in other words, use civilians as human shields the way we hear almost every day that people, that Hamas does or that Hezbollah does. And the only reason why Israel has to kill so many civilians is because Hezbollah and Hamas engage in this extremely evil act, never before seen in history, of putting their military installations near civilian infrastructure. Now, the whole claim is so preposterous. There is no area in Gaza where you can sort of mark off and say, here are the military installations. You put a neon sign up, military here. Gaza is one of the most densely packed popular, uh, places on the earth. It, was, it, it reminded me of, of the U.S. trying to fight the Taliban, who are basically just ingrained into the Afghan population. They were Afghans who believed they were defending their country first from the Soviet invasion and then from the U.S. There was no clear demarcation where the Taliban said, oh, we have our military here and then our civilians way over here. Nor do the Israelis have such clear demarcation, even though they constantly claim that only their evil terrorist enemies embed their civilian infrastructure into their military infrastructure into civilian population. In fact, uh, late last week, we reported on a map of Tel Aviv where it shows that the Israeli command and control center for the IDF was purposely built underground and right above it is nothing but civilian infrastructure, shopping malls and art galleries and places where civilians go so that there's no way to bomb the underground primary command and control center of the IDF without bombing civilian infrastructure as well, dropping bunker busters in order to get at that. So if anyone is using human civilians as human shields, it's the Israelis. And that's true of multiple locations, including the Mossad headquarters, which is located in Tel Aviv near civilian infrastructure. And in the course of his report, and now he's donning a, one of those helmets and the press vests, Jim Skiudo inadvertently, but very, very explicitly and clearly talked about how so many Israeli military targets are completely integrated into the civilian population in Tel Aviv. Here's what he said. The U.S. intel view that among the targets were Israeli airfields, but also, and this is crucial, the headquarters of Mossad, the, the International Intelligence Service of Israel, which is inside Tel Aviv. It's in the northern part of Tel Aviv, but it's in the city. It's in a densely populated area. Uh, and of course, the concern is if you're firing, even, even though Iran might consider that a military target, it is in a densely populated city uh, with civilians around it. And that's just one more layer of escalation. So wait a minute. So CNN is saying that Israel's key military facilities, including its Mossad headquarters, were built right next to and around and very in close, very, very close proximity to pure civilian infrastructure like residential buildings and shopping malls. I thought only the evil terrorists do that. Civilized countries take their military installations and put it in some open field somewhere with a big neon sign saying military installation here far, far away from civilian populations and civilian infrastructure. Only the evil Hamas terrorists and Hezbollah terrorists are sociopathic enough to put their military installations near civilians. And that's why Israel so unfortunately, so regrettably, has to kill civilians, 
not because it's its fault, but because Hamas and Hezbollah purposely make it so that their military installations are nearby or even underground civilian installations, exactly what the Israelis have done in Tel Aviv, as we reported a few days ago, using Google Maps and a New York Times report. But as Jim Scudo said today, that, yeah, they're clearly aiming, the Iranians are, at military targets. The problem is it's that those military targets are very closely embedded into this civilian infrastructure of of, of, of of Tel Aviv. Now, there were Israelis killed today, six of them, in fact, but not from the Iranian missile attack. Before the attack started, maybe an hour or two before, there was an attack by two either Israeli Arabs or people who had entered from the West Bank or from Gaza, I believe they were Israeli Arabs, who purposely went around. They had two, they had, there were two shooters, and they shot as many Israelis as they could find near a bus. And six of them were killed and several were injured. So here's the New York Times report. Quote, six killed and several injured in Tel Aviv shooting. Quote, the authorities described the shooting, which took place on a light rail train as a terror attack. No group has claimed immediate responsibility. Quote, the Israeli police and emergency services said at least six people were killed and 12 more injured when two gunmen opened fire on a light rail train in, in Tel Aviv shortly after residents were urged to seek shelter from an Iranian missile attack. The police called the attack an act of terrorism and said the gunmen were, quote, neutralized on the scene. They urged residents of the city to remain calm and follow the directions of the military's home front command. Shortly after the shooting, Israel's air defense system intercepted a swarm of missiles over Tel Aviv, loud booms and bright explosions filled the sky. Quote, the police forces are handling the scene under a missile attack, the police said in a statement about the shooting. Quote, the event is under control. Now, there was video circulating of that shooting of Israelis in action. And we're going to show you some of the video just because it's been all over the place and it gives you a sense of what happened. The video is pretty graphic. It clearly shows the shooter shooting at, at, at innocent bystanders and killing some of them. So if you don't want to see that, you should turn away. Um, but we're just going to show you a small clip of it just to give you a sense for what actually happened. It's in the uh, part of, of Tel Aviv called Yaffa, which used to be almost 50% Arab and 50% Israelis. It's been gentrified over the years. The Arabs have been driven out. There's still a, a decent size Arab population in this part of Tel Aviv, but mostly Jews, there's no word yet on what the division was of the victims, but here's some of the video. And you can see some of the bodies uh, strewn on the street as well. So those were the only deaths in Israel. I'm obviously not trying to minimize it. I'm just saying that ironically for all the talk about how Iran launched this unprecedented attack on, on Israel, the only deaths of Israelis from any violence was that attack that took place prior to the attack. Now, I think it's worth remembering not just what's been happening in Gaza, but what's happening in Beirut as well where it wasn't six Lebanese civilians who were killed, but close to a thousand over the last seven to 10 days while the Israelis airbombed Beirut. Remember they blew up pagers and other uh, mobile devices, including walkie talkies, many of which were in civilian locations like supermarkets and street fairs and restaurants. And the Lebanese government has been urging the international community for support, given how much destruction has been brought to Beirut and how many people have died just in the last 10 days alone. In case you're somebody willing to embrace this narrative that, oh, why would anyone attack Israel with missiles? They're just minding their own business. They don't hurt anybody from October 1st. That's earlier today from NPR, quote, Lebanon's government urges international community uh, international community for support amid Israel, Israel's invasion. I think that's part of what's important as well, is that Israel had begun by air bombing, by using those kind of uh, controlled explosions 
But now the Israeli military, the IDF, has crossed the Lebanese border into that sovereign country, something we've told, been told for two and a half years when Russia did it was the gravest crime against the international order. And so here's how Lebanon is responding. Quote, Lebanon's caretaker prime minister, Najib uh, Mekadi, warned on Tuesday that his country was facing, quote, one of the most dangerous phases of its history, urging the UN for emergency funding for civilians impacted by the conflict. Israeli airstrikes have killed more than 1,000 people in Lebanon over the last two weeks, according to the Lebanon, led to Lebanon's health ministry. The UN says around 1 million people, nearly a fifth of the country, one million people in Lebanon, nearly a fifth of the country, have been displaced from their homes while fleeing this bombardment after just 10 days. Here is a report from uh, Bloomberg on how, quote, Israel and Hezbollah are slipping closer to an all-out war. This was from several days ago. Um, so this has been something that has been talked about for quite a, a while now that the Israelis seem hell-bent on using the war in Gaza to open a new front in the northern part of Israel in order to enter southern Lebanon by arguing that Hezbollah has been attacking Israel nonstop since October 7th in solidarity with the people of Gaza. And yet, if you look at the chart, the data chart, as presented by the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data, you, here is the chart showing how much violence and how many uh, missile strikes have been used by the Israelis versus Hezbollah since October 7th. So the yellow is the amount of Hezbollah strikes across the Israeli border. And here in the purple is the amount of Israeli attacks into Hezbollah. So basically 80% of the attacks, the cross-border attacks since October 7th have come not from Hezbollah, but from Israel inside Lebanon, whereas about 20% of the attacks have come from Hezbollah. So if you live in the United States, if you live in the West, you probably would think exactly the opposite was true, that Hezbollah has engaged in this sustained, overwhelming attack on the poor Israelis, and the Israelis have basically done nothing until recently, when in fact, it's been an incredibly lopsided use of violence, as is typically the case where Israel is involved. Now, you can again think whatever you want about, is Israel right to destroy Gaza? Is Israel right to destroy uh, southern Lebanon? to flatten buildings in Beirut, to kill 1,000 people in a week, to internally displace 20% of the Lebanese population, to continue to bomb in Syria whenever it feels like, something we hear almost nothing about. Whatever you think of that, it's right, it's wrong, or whatever, obviously Israel is not going to be able to just continuously bomb and kill and attack and invade multiple neighbors without, at some point, those neighbors reacting and trying to impose harm on Israel. That's just not how the world works. That's just, and never has been and never will be. Because people have dignity, people have a sense of survival. And at some point when you do enough to a group of people, even if they're weaker, even if they don't, like Israel does, have the richest and most powerful country behind them, arming them and funding them and using its military to defend Israel, even if they're weaker in that sense, they're still at some point going to draw a line and say, we're not going to tolerate this any further. We're going to also impose harm on you. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.